So our topic is to look at Swami Vivekananda life as is the bridge or connecting link of the East and the West, this Western ideals and Western ideal. From we find that from time immemorial, the two trends of thoughts have tremendously influenced the minds of humankind to find the secret of this visible universe and to find the self within, what is within, and to find a relationship between what is within and what is in this universe, at the background of this universe. And this search has taken in two directions. One direction is just to search here within, another search to find what is behind this material universe as I see it. And search is the same search for truth and oneness. And it was achieved and it reached its zenith at one time, in ancient time, in the Vedic literature we find that that happened at a particular time when the values of observing the matter, the material world in a scientific way and trying to find what is behind, what it can give us, squeeze that everything and try to understand if that is the ultimate truth or not. And then, failing to understand that, failing to realize that that can give us the highest joy, the joy which unfailing joy, then the search started inwardly. That's why the great Shankaracharya who is the founder of Advaita philosophy, he, in the commentary of the Bhagavad Gita, have wonderfully mentioned that in the Vedic religion, there are two ways of looking into the universe. So he says, Di vidho hi vedakta dharma. The Vedic religion had two ways of approach. One is pravitti lakshana, one which takes you to the experience of this life and it's another is called Nibritti Lakshana. Another is that which says that no, 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 this is not the ultimate. This cannot be permanent. This is uh, momentary. That experience when takes it to some other realm that is called the Nibritti Lakshana. That, and that this twofold dharma that is the cause of the stability of the world, order, and also to direct means to attain the material prosperity and the highest good. Unless one have the material fun and joy and understand what the world can give, then why people will search for higher truth and higher spirituality? Let us be very rational. And in the ancient time, the society accepted that and the sages understood that the crying need of the masses, the whole humanity is not set in one level of mental, one mental level of spiritual growth. So who is hungry if you talk before him, okay, meditate now and your hunger will go away. What type of advice is that? If someone is, needs a clothing and is suffering in the cold, you say, oh, repeat the name of the Lord and thing will happen. <laughs> this is impractical. And in ancient India actually understood that. That's why they have excelled in both the sciences. One is called the Paravidya and Aparavidya. That's why in the Upanishad it says, Dve Vidya Veditabdi. There are two types of Vidya, wisdom, knowledge which is called para, the supreme, and opera, what is mundane, mundane in the sense what the material universe can give us. Let us have that first and find that whether we are satisfied with that. And that's why they didn't ignore that science, that philosophy of life, to live in the life, to earn 
your education, material science, development in the material aspect of every aspect of art, science, literature, culture, whatever one can get. So that was the beauty of ancient India or ancient wisdom of the sages. And there was a perfect harmony. It is not one is superior, one is inferior. It is a question of going from one experience to the other experience. So, the Shankaracharya uh, continues to say that this Vedic Dharma was practiced for a long time. But at the, as it happens, this balance was lost. And people forget the ideal and they got engrossed into the material, materialistic thought, the materialistic way of living. And then, <coughs> Swamkara says, the desire and lust arose in their mind and an unrighteousness prevailed. And dharma being subdued due to decline in the power of discrimination and wisdom, then Lord Krishna was born. So that is the point when, in, in the Gita it is repeatedly said that when the true spirit of our life is forgotten. And God incarnates again and again to give a direction in our life. So similarly, that when virtue subsides means the highest value, life should have a goal of goal. And, and Vivekananda brought that goal again back to our consciousness. We need many things in our life to survive. But that is a means to reach the goal, that itself is not the goal. We make a mistake when we forget the ultimate goal of life and only make the immediate needs as the goal of our life. And then we get frustrated because we achieve that goal with much effort and after that what we feel? I am lost. I have done so much, but where is my peace? Where is my joy? What is that I am craving for? To have that state of mind where I will not be perturbed by the sufferings and joys. I will not be disturbed by the cold and heat. I will not be disturbed by anybody, anyone. Have no authority on my peace and joy inside, tranquility inside. So that goal, when it is forgotten, then we find that by nature or God's grace, the divine personalities appear and they make us aware of it. And that's why he says that, that when it happened that discrimination was lost and power of wisdom is lost. And then what happened? That material prosperity has gained by en engaging into the actions which desire to enjoy and go to heaven etc. and bring the worldly success. But when practiced in the spirit of complete surrender, the same work, what Shankara gave, what Sri Krishna gave the idea. Not that to live in the world is bad, not that it is enjoyment of life is wrong, but if it is only increases your desire to more and more enjoyment, then you become a slave of that situation. Rather, through that experience, one can practice the, uh, the spirit of complete surrender to God and without any desire lead to the purification of the mind. Pure mind then leads to the experience of the ultimate knowledge. So the experience of life is very important. That can purify our heart if we have a further goal of life. So this twofold dharma, which is called the pravitti and nivritti, that means, as I have said, which is engages us into the materialistic affluence and development or material prosperity, gives us material knowledge and wisdom, and that which is the spiritual wealth and the spiritual knowledge which liberates us from all bondage. These are the two ways it is going on in the world since its creation. In the Vedic time it is more and also Vedas declare that this is the two sciences given with the knowledge of material, how to
prosper in material life as also how to prosper in spiritual life. So these two, as it happens, it, 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 as the time goes on, it declines and declines and declines. Again, a boosting comes. Some of the great spiritual uh, illuminaries come and pushes us towards that ultimate goal, going through the experience of life and then move on. Again, it happened in 19th century, particularly in Calcutta. You can find that, that all the young people, they are getting this idea that materialistic approach is the approach of life. And materialistic approach means what? Only what is sensed, only what this matter as I see, that is the reality. And if I want to penetrate to this matter through my science and technology, I can find how much is the real, that is the reality. And probably there is nothing beyond that. So that skeptic idea dominated in the minds of the people in during that period of time when Swami Vivekananda was born, being educated with the Western ideas and thoughts, he denied all this type of worship and other things which is going on. Because it's matter. You are worshipping an idol. Idol means what? It's a matter. It's a stone. It's a piece of wood. So you are worshipping that. So, and this cannot give the idea of the transcendental reality. So, the whole of in, in culture was getting confused with this idea and they got involved into the purely the way of life turned into only experiencing the fun and joy started, they started all the negative sides of the western education drinking, dancing but, and making that life and ignoring agnostic life even not God is not there that type of philosophy also came so it is a question and the, but Swami Vivekananda came being educated with this type of idea he came and he had his own experience of course transcendental experience but he wants to get confirmed on that truth that's why he met a person Ramakrishna as you know and he he does not he does not know understand anything of materialism he is a person who is always focused in what is within and we dive deep into that inner consciousness and in his experiments he understood the ultimate truth and what is that truth he does not see matter anywhere he looks at the tree he see consciousness there he looks at the door seal. It is not door seal made of wood. It is consciousness, vibrant. The door, the door seal, the pots, the pans, the earth, the soil, anything he sees, it is nothing but that absolute consciousness. He reaches that zenith of experience, that oneness. He sees that oneness everywhere. And that is the teaching of the Advaita Vedanta. That is the teaching of the ancient wisdom and all religion is heading towards that same reality and truth. But this perspective of Advaita, what Ramakrishna experienced, there is no exclusivism. It is all included there. This matter is not excluded, but he penetrated the apparent covering which blocks our eyes as the trees, as the plants, as human being, he penetrated that and he saw it is all vibrant with consciousness and love and joy. That is the transcendental reality. And that is the East, the main vibrant idea behind all the practices of the Eastern thought. And it is nothing East and West was divided that way. But it is the question of the human mind divided this in a way to see that consciousness behind, to go that far, or to see that matter 
what with our eyes, ears, telescopes, microscopes, and all the tools which we have can give us an idea about the reality behind. And then this quest went on and Swami Vivekananda then entered into the realm of questioning and trying to find that what is this mystic vision? These are all hallucinations of the brain. That was another concept. Because material, if materialistic idea is that if it is this white, it cannot be black. It's true. If it is hot, it cannot be cold. If it is joy, it cannot be suffering. But here comes the Vedantic idea. Joy and suffering are the obverse and reverse of the same thing. Just we have read that just now. Uh, we heard from their reading. So, it is a quite departure from the thinking process of the materialistic view of life. If you say it is exact what is it, it cannot be the other. There is exclusivism, not inclusivism. In inclusion is that wherever, whatever is there, every position is there in this Vedantic perspective, looking from varied states of progress in the human mind. And there, this material state is a state for leading us to the ultimate experience of oneness. So Swami Vivekananda then fought with Swami Sri Ramakrishna, questioned, doubted, and then he put this again and again that thinking properly, your hallucination of the brain giving you this vision and experience, and all these types of things. And when he was so much doubtful, then he said, he was ridiculing what Ramakrishna said. This pot is God. The bowl is God. What type of ludicrous idea is this? He was talking with Hajra, the man sitting in his Ramakrishna's room next to the door. And Sri Ramakrishna came there and asked, what are you talking about? Then Noren loudly said, yes, we are laughing at your statement. This pot is God, this pan is God. Uh, so everything is God. What type of concept is this? Sri Ramakrishna in that ecstatic mood just touched him and what transformation. He saw that whole vision changed. It is no matter. This was matter, so solid. It is hard. It is liquid. Everything is melting. Everything is melting into that one level of consciousness. That is the meeting of East and West. Here is the real meeting of East and West. It is not, it is no more matter. You are viewing as matter. That matter transcends into that experience. It is tangible. It can be handed over. You can get it. Not that matter is wrong, but viewing that as only matter is the wrong thing. And then in the laboratory, what Sri Ramakrishna experimented, the ancient wisdom in the Abdi Upanishads lived by himself, he transmitted that to Vivekananda. And what is the transformation? He could not make any distinction between matter and consciousness. And now we are studying consciousness studies in the universities to find what is consciousness. Is the brain consciousness? Or the consciousness of the eyes or the skin? Or what is that consciousness? How far it can go? And then when that consciousness permeated into the personality of Swami Vivekananda, actually East and West mingled together. And then what happened? This Vivekananda, young Noren, was knocking his head on the iron railing of a park nearby his room, home. And he is really confused whether it is piece of iron or it is consciousness. 
Could you believe that? Would we have any some doubt any time <laughs> that is it, is it table or is it something liquid or or some vapor vapor some vapor thing? It is like that. He had the concrete experience, the transcendental experience, and he lived in that consciousness for some days together. So this is the question that this Swami Vivekananda was needed in that age to harmonize. Swami Vivekananda said that each nation has a special play to role in the role of bringing a world civilization, a human civilization. It is not India, it is not America, it is not Germany, it is not any as such. It is one humanity. And Advaita Vedanta teaches us we are all one, irrespective of our color, creed, nation-wise birth or gender. These are all superficial things. We are all one. That should be the world civilization. And he said that every nation has its own speciality. Some nation have their criterion. Some are best in their political ideas. Some are good in their moral and ethical values. Some are good in spiritual wealth and prosperity. They should all mingle together to bring a wonderful uh, world altogether new, unknown, where everyone will be equally benefited by these teachings to go from one level to the other level and fixing the goal to ultimate freedom and ultimate bliss to be reached. So see, we find that Swami Vivekananda, that's why he went to the length and breadth of India and he found what India has to give as a nation and what he lacks. And at the same time, he understood the cry of the suffering people. He said it is, he is not a people. He didn't say it is man and women. Rather it is God in human form, in, in the form of man and woman. And he saw that India has a great gift to be given to the world and to the world's civilization. It has contributed before and it will have to contribute. He is writing a letter, beautiful letter he wrote to uh, He wrote to uh, he said that what is India, England or America for us? We are the servants of that God who by ignorance is called man. This is whole world is one. No consideration of one country versus other country, but each one should contribute their best to build a world civilization and where everyone will be treated as divine. There is one, there is but one basis of well-being, social, political or spiritual, to know that I and my brother are one. This is the true, this is true for all countries, of all people. So this is the idea that whoever is there, wherever we are, we belong to one family, we are all brothers and sisters and the unity in this diversity is to be found out and reach that zenith of experience where we can all claim that same truth. Swami Vivekananda said in another place that he preached this spirituality and talked that the truth has no ge geographical limit. As one of his admirer, American writer Laura Glenn, she writes, Truth is the same at all points of the compass. The law of gravitation does not function more in Europe than in Africa or in Asia. The facts of chemistry are as true in an Indian as in a German laboratory. 
So as is the material science, if it is a science, it is true. So the spiritual science is the same and it is true for all personalities, whoever may be in whatever land they live. Swami Vivekananda wrote also in to one king of India. He wrote, as no individual or nation can live by holding itself apart from the community of others. Give and take is a law. And if India wants to raise herself once more, it is absolutely necessary that she brings out her treasures and throw them broadcast upon among the nations of the earth and in return be ready to receive what others have to give her. A very broad and vast idea as if bridging this together. We knew that it is the concept that East is East, West is West. There is never a connection there. That was a wrong concept. Swami Vivekananda wanted to say, if there is no East, there is no West. There is only one humanity. And that is one civilization. And we belong to that one culture, universal culture. And that is based on Vedantic understanding. Uh, that is the Paravidya, the highest wisdom. So now, what Swami Vivekananda did on these views of his, he talked about, he, he understood the sufferings of India. He understood the potentialities in India. That spirituality, that innate experience of oneness, understanding God in different facets and different levels of mental condition, how God can be viewed in different ways, and how they are all leading to the one conclusive experience. Sri Ramakrishna's life, that's why, is called the harmony of religion. That is the India's contribution. It is not exclusivism. Everyone is moving towards the same sun and viewing from different levels. You describe it and you say, oh, my view, view is the right view and others' view is the wrong view. But Swami Vivekananda wanted to brought that spirit. That's why in this country his, preaches, his preaching was about harmony of all religions. A very vital point which is very taking manifestation in different ways in different cities and different states of this country and everywhere. How to bridge the gap between one religion and other religion. No, no question is higher and lower. You, you want to enjoy God according to your own appetite. That means in your mental appetite and capability to absorb that. And someone maybe in some other way want to view and absorb God and the joy of God. Don't hate anyone. Don't say no to anyone. That on the background of Advaita, every position is there. So, just move on and ultimately realize the truth. That message was brought here in this country. And the message, the concept which in this country, Swami Vivekananda came and went to them every corner of this country and understood another question that guilt, sin idea. I am a sinner. I have done something, mistake. So repent. Whole life repent and cry and weep. And here comes Vivekananda bringing this message of the Vedanta. You are divine. Think. You did some mistake. You can come out of that. Be bold. And see, sometimes he says, be proud that you have done some mistakes. What's there in it? Who can say, who can say this? Uh, in this particularly, in this context, when Swami Vivekananda came, Ingersoll said that you are too um, strong to say all these words. Had you come 50 years before, you would have been stoned to death <laughs> had you uttered these words. So this context, he is bold. He is not thinking of what will happen, what people will think. But he is trying to build this bridge that you are not sinner. That's why his major idea, we travel from lower truth to higher truth. But we are not sinner. We go through the experience of life. 
why he gave this message? This country, they have, with that materialistic prosperity, with accuracy in their... Swamiji appreciated this America so much. He said, nowhere in the world is to be found another nation like America. So generous, broad-minded, hospitable, so sincerely eager to accept new ideas. He appreciated the American women at the highest degree. And she said, they are like mothers, they are like goddess. And they protected me like a child eh? and took care of me everywhere. And actually, that is his real voice of the heart. Because he, for him, there is no distinction between this country or that country. But he was like a mother trying to feed the necessities of what this country needs and what India needs. And he stood as a bridge between this material idea, materialistic idea and the spiritual idea and blended them together. That's why we find that Swami Vivekananda in this country talked about Vedanta and Vedanta and Vedanta. He didn't speak that dualistic religion. He didn't speak, speak something, only tantric religion. He didn't speak of any particular sectarian religion because it is all comprehensive background in which everyone is set. In the infinite, he said in one place, no? In, in the azura of the sky, all the stars are there. It is no exclusive idea that mine is separate, yours are separate. The bad, all, all the, it is the background. So his message for this country and for the West was to rise above our weakness, to be bold, to move on, even we have done some mistakes. It is no sin. It is all we are moving towards God, consciously or unconsciously. If you move consciously, that's your great joy. If you don't move consciously, you cry and weep. <laughs> so Swami Vivekananda said, why weep? Be, be strong. Say, I am that. In me is divine. Say what that. So that is his message to the West. And it was lacking in this country. Because I am, it is not meant that there is no religion. It, don't misunderstand that way. But the, it was there. But emphasis was gone. Spirituality meant going to the church. Huh? Swami Shahananda Maharaj used to say, who is considered a member of a church? If you can go Sunday lectures, then it's a good uh, devotee in the churches. So if you can, cannot go once a month, that's okay. So okay. And if you cannot go even then, once a year you attend one lecture or in a church you attended one hour, then you are a religious person. That is not religion. That is not spirituality. Going to church only once upon a time, and that in my religious life is there only in the lecture time, or I attending the church service that time, and all 365 days is to me, whatever I live in whatever way, that is not spirituality. Christ didn't say that. As in our Upanishads, there are so many truths, but it is not followed. As we read, Sankara says, decline comes. It is the human nature to avoid that. But Vivekananda came to bring this idea. Uh, I and my father are one. That spirit, uplifting spirit, that was necessary in this country. And giving this encouragement to move on. And to find that all religions, not tolerance, acceptance, or every path is a valid path. Ramakrishna's life, his own life experience, he established that idea in this country. And that was needed. So, West with the East. And now West goes back. At what he wanted? He looked at the conditions of the Indian women, Indian masses, the poor, the downtrodden, and how the society is going to every year some famine, no food, no shelter, no right living, as if they have forgotten that life can give some material pleasure. That's why Vivekananda's cry was 
to do something for them. The same God who is here having in the experience of material science and prosperity still searching for peace and joy, restlessness in the heart. The same there, they are also crying. They have spirituality but they need the material science to blend their life and make it a pleasing life to survive in the world from suffering, from health, from health hazard, from non-opportunity of having no education. So Swami Vivekananda created this band of monastics and this order of Ramakrishna order has been created first. What is the ideal? Keep that high spiritual ideal of non-dual. That one truth, absolute truth. All humanity is same. We are all moving towards the divinity. Keep that ideal in the top. Realize that in yourself. And what you do? You dedicate your whole life. For whom? The same God whom you worship while you close your eyes. The same God in the form of the poor. In the form of the downtrodden. In the form of the women, widows who are suffering in so many ways because of the lack of bridging this gap. India what has done? The path of spirituality has taken the path as I say Nibritti Laksham. Nibritti Laksham means not this. This world is all. This all world is all mundane. All changing. So there is no joy in it. So give up, give up, give up. That ideal may be really meaningful for some advanced soul. But millions live in hunger. They need to be fed. They have enough religion. You go in India, you will find. They have enough religion. In the morning you will find thousands and thousands. You take a boat from uh, Calcutta and move towards a bye-bye boat just in the morning time. Take a boat and just that boat rides. On the both side you will find hundreds and hundreds of temples. And all people are taking a holy bath in the Ganges. Even today they are going on. It is not necessary. People did not have to say, oh come today is Sunday and here is a lecture going on. <laughs> you need not have to inform. Even the uh, Kumbh Mela. Eh? Kumbh Mela. Eh? Nobody invites anybody by the microphone. Hey, we are having a kumumala. You come, come, come. Rather, people from all corners of the world flocking towards that to get what type of thing? See, austerity. What? You are a householder. You are a monk. No question. You have to take a deep. What deep? What time? Oh, it is a hot bath, spring, hot spring. And you have to take a uh, beautiful bath. Or easing? No. What you do? In the coldest possible time when you will be freezing and you wouldn't have to take a dip. And then you will learn punnam, <laughs> auspiciousness. Huh? This, to, this austerity side went into such a bone, backbone of the country, they ignored the material science. They forgot how to cultivate more, grow more fruit, uh, crops, huh? how to gain more education. More make means and ways for material money, prosperity, wealth, building something, infrastructure of that. Swami Vivekananda, with the help of these monks, started that work in the field of education, in the field of women upliftment, in the field of giving the technical training. And Swami Vivekananda actually when he came first time, he came for earning some money so that he can start a technical school in India. Apparently it seems, seems that a monk is doing the material work. And actually it was criticized because of that. This Ramakrishna monks, they are not monks. And they are social workers. They are all going and doing all these things and technical things and technical school. What is that? Is this a spiritual thing at all? See, it is the blending of the Western uh, education, training, which can uplift the condition. And then they have their spirit, they will grow spontaneously. And here, it is all matured field in the West. Education is there, earning is there, uh, health condition is good, people are careful about them. And they, 
know the how to enjoy the life. Now there is also craving in the heart to give them the highest wisdom of spirituality. That is the contribution. So it is each one should contribute to build a new philosophy of life, new social condition where spirituality and practice of our livelihood, easy, smooth life should blend together so that few people who will be going beyond, they will go anyway. They will be wandering monks in this country or that country. Even here are desert monks, no? There are many people who do tremendous austerity in this country also. Uh, so, uh, in, uh, even in Catholic churches you can find some groups out there who are very austere. But that they will do. But what the question of the mass is? So there we should have to have this blending. That's why Vivekananda stands as a bridge between this Eastern thought and the Western thought so that it can be blended together and everyone will get benefit out of this blending or joining, taking each other's idea and nurturing each one. That's why Swami Vivekananda says that you cannot, you take the Indian treasure of spirituality was where? It was hidden in the hands of few people. Now, of course, you know, printing technology has come. You can Google search and get all the books. <laughs> in early days, to go to read a book, you will have to go to some library. And where will you find? There is handwritten manuscript. And you have to take and a copy yourself. Then you can read. Go to a teacher. Ask about the Vedic wisdom. They will say. So you have to be competent student. Otherwise, no. Now, anyone can go and Google search and get Isha Upanishad, Kato Upanishad. You can get the Vedas. All the Vedas are available. You can even know how, this, how to chant the Vedas. You don't need any, any other certification. Huh? It's opened up. That's the point. Swami Vivekananda wanted. Let the knowledge go. Let people will decide what they will accept. Every person has a different... You know, as, as, as I was asking one day foolishly, I said, we take so many medicines. How it goes to the particular problem of your body? <laughs> no, no. You are taking, say, say, blood pressure medicine. You are taking some heart medicine. Are you, you are taking it here. And how your heart is getting benefit out of that? They said there is receptors in the blood. Is it not? Am I right? They say there is some receptors in the blood. So they take their, they, uh, for the heart, there is agency. They collect all the heart material there. <laughs> so, so every part of the disease, there is some receptors in the blood and they collect their material. Now, he will not collect the other's material. They are receptive for one idea. So in our case also same. There is some receptivity in our heart. And we are in need of one thing, which you may not need. I may need one thing. You may need another thing. So let, if, they, if, if you go into the uh, restaurant and you find that only one soup is available, how is that? You will find another restaurant because when varieties are available. Because you need your food, I need my food. So if that is called the world civilization. That is called the human civilization where everyone with the receptivity can absorb whatever philosophy suits them. And to understand that we are all a whole one and we are going to reach that same destination. And that is the Vivekananda's contribution. And Vivekananda is the bridge of the East and West. And that bridge has brought this civilization, as he says, the secrets of the Eastern thought embedded in the cells, in the hearts of few sages and saints, in the experience of Ramakrishna. Had there been no Vivekananda, how Ramakrishna's experiences would have flooded the world, to bring, broadcast it, and then bring harmony, bring joy, bring peace. And where there is a need, another need in the physical level, Get the materialistic experiences, enrich yourself and move on to the journey of the spirit. So this is the 
special contribution of Swami Vivekananda, I would request you that you should read at least the life of Ram Vivekananda. It's such a fascinating life and what he did for us in this country and in India, really, it is, it is to be remembered. And really it is an unusual life of an expression of freedom, truth and joy. That is the thing. It is the, it, Vivekananda never spoke of anything but freedom of the soul. You are free. You are divine. You will find nothing in Vivekananda negative. And even in his book, when he was dictating some rules for the monastics of the Ramakrishna order, he said, see, in my instruction, if there is any negative, you make it positive. Rules means what? Don't do this, don't do that. Is it not? But could you believe that only one Vivekananda gave a dictation what should be the rule for the monks in this order? There is no negative word. You cannot do that, it's not there. Do this, do this, do this. A big problem came when in our order we don't allow any other drink or what you call drug. You know? But one thing, because Samiji used to smoke, Ramakrishna used to hubble bubble, have some smoke. So smoke is allowed. <laughs> Smoking is allowed. But first you have to say, but that thought didn't come. So the thought is that you cannot drink, you have to write. Huh? You cannot drink alcohol, you cannot have some drug. No, no, no. So how to make it positive? <laughs> so ultimately, the conclusion came that in this monastic order, only is allowed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>